1967 was the year a fairy tale came true. Celtic, a homegrown side from the east end of Glasgow, qualified for the European Cup for the first time and beat Inter Milan, the costliest team in Europe. They were the first British team ever to reach the final. At home, they coupled victory in Europe with something no previous winner of the European Cup had ever achieved. Grand Slam of victories in their national cup and league competitions in the same season. In passing, they also lifted the only two remaining Scottish trophies, the League Cup and the Glasgow Cup. Previous winners of the European Cup, like Real Madrid, Benfica and Inter Milan, had roamed three continents to bring back players at astronomical transfer fees. Of Celtic's first team pool of 16 players, 12 were reared by Celtic and the other four came from the Glasgow region and in total cost a mere 65,000 pounds. Even more important than the victories themselves was the manner of their achievement. Defensive soccer had been slowly strangling the game. Celtic ushered in a new era of fast, attractive football. fans what they came to see. Goals. 200 in a season. Yet they played the second half of the season without their ace goal scorer, Joe McBride, who still managed to score more goals in half a season than anyone else in Scotland in the whole year. What is the secret of this remarkable team and their support? support is not merely the crowd at a football match. The club newspaper, the Celtic View, sells over 30,000 copies a week and is sent all over the world to supporters abroad who may have only childhood memories of a green and white jersey and a few fading photographs to sustain them. Yet still they listen on shortwave radio for news of the Celtic score and still let us home begin. How the Celts do. There are teams in every continent named after Celtic and playing in green and white jerseys. There are Celtic supporters clubs all over the world. One in Carmen, New Jersey, recently invited Jimmy McGrory across as their guest of honor at their annual dinner. While American supporters like Jim Mellon often make the trip back to Glasgow for key games. But it's the home support that's the foundation of it all. Celtic are a Glasgow team, and Glaswegians take their football seriously. It's not just a game. It's their 90-minute revenge on the rest of the week. Glasgow, a divided city. A city which has imported Ireland's problems as well as its people. Celtic players have been of all religions and none the support are still Catholics of by now distant Irish origin. The bond between Celtic and their support is a very special one. This uh, Celtic Football Club, in which I have the great honour to be chairman, is much more than a football club. To a lot of people, it's been a way of life. And really a chance of purposes to feed the poor of the East End of Glasgow. The East End of Glasgow today. The welfare state has not yet eradicated Glasgow's poverty. It is here that Celtic have their roots. Founded in 1888.
create, as the circular said, to provide funds for the maintenance of dinner tables for our needy children in the missions of St. Mary's, Sacred Heart, and St. Michael's. The poverty of the 1880s was a poverty without hope. For the immigrant Irish, untutored, unskilled, and often unwanted, it was worse. They were cheap labor, resented as such. And to give edge to the resentment, they had a different religion. No welfare state, no unemployment relief. The only refuge, the pawnbroker, if you had anything left to pawn. And so it was that a local headmaster, Brother Walfred, a Marist brother, founded Celtic. Celtic were an immediate success. Scottish Cup finalists in their first season. At matches involving Celtic, the gates doubled. Brother Walfred had started more than he knew. Supporters' break clubs were formed, linked to temperance organizations, a practice which has long since discontinued. To captain that first Celtic team, he brought from the famous Renton Football Club, James Kelly, the father of the present chairman. Also in the team, Willie Mealy. Soon, Kelly was to become a director and later chairman, while Willie Mealy became the club's manager for over half a century. In their 80 years, Celtic have had only four managers, all of them ex-players. Willie Mealy was the boss right up till 1940, when he was succeeded by one of his former captains, Jimmy McStay, who was in turn succeeded in 1945 by yet another Celt who played under Mealy, Jimmy McGrory. His rule lasted till 1965. McGrory's most successful team was the one which won the Coronation Cup in 1953 and went on to complete a League and Cup double in 1954. The captain, the present manager, Jock Steen. When I was here as a player, it wasn't a job to me, it was a place of enjoyment, a place that I enjoyed working in. And the directors of the club were people that I uh, have known both as a player, as a coach, and now as a manager. And I look forward to working with these people. Celtic are now a large and successful club. But Brother Walfred's aim in founding the club has never been lost sight of. Each year, more is given to charity than is distributed to directors and shareholders. We regard everybody connected with the Celtic Football Club as one uh, big uh, family. Um, in every way, we treat them as in individuals. We have always uh, tried, as far as possible, uh, to rear our own players. Many of our great teams have been reared by ourselves, as has more or less the present team, with one or two exceptions. <laughs> Assistant manager Sean Fallon is now the only Irishman at Parkhead. Tremendous family atmosphere here. That is obvious any time you see the boys together with their laughter and joking with each other. With a broke like that, who's going to argue?
I think when you bring in young boys such as we are playing for us at the moment, see them achieving manhood and see them playing for their country and bringing honour and distinction to their club, I think these are the things that uh, give me great pleasure indeed. I would say that uh, seeing these youngsters who more or less left school come in here, now they've all got families and I would say quite secure for the rest of their life through their efforts on a playing field. I don't think this in any doubt gives anyone greater pleasure than seeing these things being achieved. What is it like to be a Celtic player? Billy McNeil is captain. Once the first couple of weeks of the season are underway, normally training is restricted to the mornings only. We've been described very often as a fit, fit side. I think this is true because we put a lot of effort into training. We train very hard in the mornings. Afternoons are, are free, which means for, for the married, married lads like myself, it's an ample opportunity to play with the kids in the garden. Keeps me very fit, this too, by the way. Uh, at night, too. Well, we've often got ample time off at night for, for leisure, for our own purposes, hobbies, or golfing, or anything. But at the same time, too, with the success of the team, we find that we've had more and more call on our services to present medals, to attend quiz shows, to even just to attend normal supporters function. This keeps us pretty well active in the night, in the evenings, too. This has been a tough year for Celtic. To cope with the injuries and the strain on players, Jock Steen has operated a first team pool of 16 players. 13 of them have played for their country. What other club could leave out two or three internationalists each week without provoking transfer requests? My injury has been a big disappointment to me, as everyone will gather. Especially when the team are going so well this year, it looks like uh, the boys will clear the boards. As a boy, I always dreamed about playing for Celtic. And uh, when the chance came along for me to sign for Celtic, I jumped at it. Only players who have played for Celtic can say this, and even the old timers will say the same. They always feel that when, once they pull the Celtic jersey on, there's just a feeling it can't be described. And uh, although I'm not in the team, as I said before, it's a disappointment, but my heart's there with them every time they're on that park, and I hope that they do clear the boards, even though I may not be playing. Players and supporters alike feel part of this tradition. Schoolboys can recite the famous teams of the past like litanies. Halfback lines like Young, Lonnie and Hay. The sheet anchor of the side which won the league six times in a row between 1905 and 1910. Brilliant individuals like Jimmy Quinn and McMenemy. And of course, Patsy Gala, second from the right in the front row in a match against Air United in 1923, as his own playing days were drawing to a close. Some say he was the greatest inside forward they have ever seen. Comparing past with present is always impossible in sport. The greats of yesterday were good enough to be the best then, and who can ask more than that? Patsy Gallagher, to me, was one of the greatest footballers I ever saw. And just to recount, and one of the, the famous goals in my first cup final, 1925, Patsy, Patsy Gallagher, he got, uh, got a pass from Peter Wilson, and right on our own 18 yards line, and I'll guarantee that he beat about five men on the road and staggered. Every time he was tackled, he was down in the ground, he got up as quickly, and inside the six-yard line, 
he made a somersault and took the ball with him between his feet and into the net. McGrory himself is another Celtic legend, but we have a yardstick for his achievements. His record of 550 goals in first-class football has never been equaled. Many of them, like this one, which set up the new record in 1935, were scored with his head, yet he very nearly didn't come to Parkhead at all. Well, I said, there's one club I wouldn't like to go to, and that was Celtic. Uh, I was only a young lad, and Celtic had Johnny Mackay, famous inside forward, as a reserve to Patsy Gallagher, so what chance had I get in the game? But of course that didn't make any difference when they come and ask me to sign, I signed without any hesitation at all. In the same team as McGrory was one of the best loved Celtic players of all time, goalkeeper John Thompson. He joined Celtic in 1927, when he was only 18. He came from Wellesley in Fife. By the time he was 21, he had established himself as Scotland's national goalkeeper. One chronicler claims he had the spring of a jaguar and the effortless grace of a skimming swallow. Some of his saves are still talked of. He seemed to be able to change the direction of his dive in midair. In 1928, in the Glasgow Cup final, he defied Queen's Park almost single-handed and Celtic won 2 nothing. Songs have been written about him. Yet John Thompson, like so many others, from Sonny Jim Young at the turn of the century to Jock Steen and many of the present team, was neither Irish nor Catholic. Celtic have never cared what a player's religion was, providing he had the ability and character to play for Celtic. <laughs> Teams, Glasgow Rangers and Dark Shirts play on their own ground. John Thompson, Scottish international goalkeeper, is among the Celtic team who play in striped shirts. Celtic fielded John Thompson, Cook and McGonagall, Wilson, McStay and Geats, R. Thompson and A. Thompson, McGrory, Scarf and Napier. Rangers, Dawson Gray and McCauley, Michael John Simpson and Brown, Fleming and Marshall, English, McPhail and Morton. Famous names in both teams, but for the 75,000 crowd, it was a dull game. hesitated before diving at the forward speed. Six years later, he died in the Victoria Infirmary. He was only 23. Fifty thousand people lined the route of his funeral. Celtic, like the race whose name they bear, seemed fated to have great joys and great sorrows. There are happier memorials too. Celtic have won every honour in football and have a habit of winning any cup that is up for retention by the victors. They won the Empire Exhibition Trophy in 1938, the Victory in Europe Cup after the war, the St. Mungo Trophy, the Coronation Cup in 1953, and the unique award of a shield to commemorate their never equal run of six league wins in succession. But much of the glory was in the distant past and supporters are reluctant to live on memories. As a schoolboy, when I supported Celtic, my memories are a wee bit disappointing. I had heard from uncles and various other relatives of the great Celtic team of the past, like every other schoolboy at that time. But uh, my own memories around about then 
were very, very disappointed, as I've said. Celtic seem to have gone through a very, very lean spell. Since then, it's always been my ambition to be a member of a Celtic team consistently winning honours. I think that Celtic's place in Scottish football is at the top of the league. It's regularly winning trophies. And nowadays, it's even more important, it's representing Scotland in Europe. McNeil and many of the present team were probably schoolboys on the terracing when Celtic regained some of their former greatness in 1954. The captain of the Celtic team, Jock Steen. Celtic had just won the league for the first time in 16 years. Now they were after the cup. Also in the team, the present assistant manager, Sean Fallon, trainer Neil Mark, scouts John Higgins and Willie Fairley. Coach to the second team, Alec Bowden. Goalkeeper John Bonner is now in charge of the Celtic development plan. And another great Celt in that tradition of brilliant individualists that stretches from Patsy Gallagher right to Jimmy Johnson today, Charlie Tully. His brilliant, if erratic, virtuosity kept the support going during the lean years. completed a league and cup double. The next time they were to achieve this feat was in season 66-67. The then captain is now manager, Ox Steen. Even as a player, Steen was a strategist rather than a brilliant individualist. Those two players have been playing. You know the main idea as well of it is to try and create space for ourselves. For the second year running, Jock Steen has been named Britain's Manager of the Year. We all know that we've got to play the game in space. So it's up to each individual player, no necessarily on the ball, off the ball or otherwise, to make room for somebody else who's coming into the space to use it. We know normally our, our midfield men, Bobby and Bertie. So, these are the men here who want to get playing, so these men here have got to make space by attracting men to take them away to allow them to, to get playing. But so if we get the game built up here and everybody's swinging across the field here, bringing this here for Tam Gamble in most cases to come through here and do something, or the same on the other side of the field. Jim Craig or whoever it may be on this side. That's a very good move, that boss. You know, when we <laughs> holding the ball in the middle of the park there, big Yogi hesitated just that few seconds to allow Tom, Tommy and Gemmo to come up the park. Well, that's all right if Yogi hesitates to take full back away and give me time to come up behind him. At the back, it's always been Billy and John Clark tightening up here at the back. Well, as far as I can see, boss, it just means that John and I have to make up our mind early which one of us is going to pick up the main striker. Perhaps his greatest triumph is that he has taken 11 players who individually don't think they're the best in the world and moulded them into a team with so much faith in one another that are. For goalkeeper Simpson too, a dream year. At 36, his 22nd season in senior football. He was playing football when most of the present team were in their prams.
support, the tradition, the atmosphere all help. But it's the dedicated professionalism of players and staff that win the matches. Any team that can create something from a dead ball, a shot at goals, this is something that, uh, this is success. They don't always go in, as you'll see in some of the shooting that some of them have at times. Uh, we're a bit annoyed ourselves at it. But if you never try anything, you never succeed. But it can pay important dividends. Celtic v Dukla Prague. A free kick. And a goal. To make it 3-1. Enough to see them through the return leg in Prague. And so become the first British team ever to reach the final of the European Cup. game in Czechoslovakia, Celtic had to play in the Scottish Cup final against Aberdeen. Clubs have a habit of slumping in form after a midweek European fixture, especially an away one. Celtic had done so the previous year, when after losing to Liverpool in the Cup Winners' Cup, they only drew with Rangers in the Scottish Cup final and lost the replay. Would it happen again? You never can tell in the Cup. One mistake, and you're runner-up. Well, this is another game, no different from the last one. You know well from the season started, every game's been an important one. So let's make sure that we don't slip up, we're being casual, we're being careless nearly in the game. We've refereed mistakes in the game, some for you, some against you, but make sure that referees' decisions don't upset each individual style of play. Except the decisions good and bad go on with the game. This can be a year that everyone else can remember. So let's make sure that each player helps each other. Make sure if somebody's having a bad game, somebody near them helps them. So let's go now, Billy, and make sure that this is another game that will add to the rest of the victories we've had and it'll be a season we'll all remember. players after 60 competitive games that season must have been immense. The league, the cup, even the European Cup seemed within their grasp, yet nothing was theirs yet. were in fine voice. Most of the Celtic team have been Celtic supporters since childhood. Playing for Celtic is for them not a job, but the fulfillment of a dream. This fantastic loyalty to the club is what makes the difference between 11 individuals and a great team.
Wallace had been caught only a few months previously, just before Joe McBride was injured. He was paying dividends, and well on his way to a Scottish Cup and League medal, and the prospect of playing in the final of the European Cup.
20 minutes after the end of the game, not a soul had left the ground, waiting in vain to greet their heels. Coming back was difficult because a club with the history this club has, it really must be the best and the... Uh, to put yourself in a seat to give it the best, is, uh, I think it's something really great to try it. Well, I always felt that this would be a challenge worthwhile doing, more particularly as the players that I had brought, more or less, to the club in some respect, the Neils, the Murders, the Olds, many of the other boys who came in here, nothing at all. I was coming back to work alongside and I felt that uh, together we could do something to make the club great again. encounter between the two clubs in years. James Bond, alias Sean Connery, was there. Celtic had fought it against Dundee United in midweek, and now only a week after the cup final, they were facing their old rivals. Probably only one man in the crowd wasn't concerned with the ancient rivalry between Celtic and Rangers. Helenio Herrera, the manager of Internazionale Milan, Celtic's opponents in the European Cup final. But for everybody else, this was a game which could decide the Scottish League. Celtic needed one point from their last two games to clinch the title. Rangers were their closest challengers. Not that an old firm game needs any added excitement. They are seldom great football games. Too much is at stake. Even the supporters go home exhausted. The teams had met three times already this season, and Celtic had won each game. But this is a match which has a habit of running counter to form. Ten years previously, as ranked outsiders, Celtic had beaten Rangers 7-1 in the final of the League Cup, a result as isolated as it was spectacular. But Celtic supporters have never allowed Rangers to forget it. Rangers' first goal was a winner all the way. Had Celtic taken on too much? Were they losing far just when the league looked within their grasp? The 
Within a minute came the ends. A scrambled affair, but still an equalizer. to win any week. Again from Jimmy Johnson. Rangers snatched an equaliser, but the league was won. Seldom can both sets of supporters have left the ground so happy. A draw saved Rangers' honour, but it gave Celtic the league. Scottish football history, the European Cup final. Celtic's cure for battle fatigue has been sea mill on the Ayrshire coast for over 50 years. Yeah, get it, get it! Oh. 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 Yeah, get it, get it
Sharpen up the shooting. An awkward bouncing ball or a rebound might give the chance of a goal in the European Cup final. Four days before the final, the great trek began. Sunday, the Celtic aid of cars and buses started the long drive to Lisbon. Prestwick 
every few minutes through the night and all the next morning. Twelve thousand Celtic supporters went to Lisbon, the biggest sporting airlift in history. founded a team to feed the poor of the east end of Glasgow. Now in many cases the grandchildren of those self-same poor were flying to Lisbon for a few hours hoping to see that team, his team, become the champions of Europe. The Celtic aid arrives in Lisbon, most of it. One bus broke down and supporters hired a fleet of taxis to make a dash to see the game. There are hitchhikers, campers. Portugal felt to their hearts. Herrera had appealed to them to support Inter Milan because they too were Latins. But surely there was something Latin about these men from the cold north who sang and waved flags all day and had traveled so far to support their team. Despite the success, Celtic have a sympathetical quality. Underdogs throughout the world feel that Celtic is their team. If faith and hope could win football matches, Pinto Milan might as well have stayed at home. This was something of a crusade, a pilgrimage. Celtic supporters had not traveled this far to be beaten. They would will the team to win. Scotland to win four major trophies in a season. Surely this was the year for them to win five. And it was a brand new trophy too, the sort that Celtic usually win. This was their first time in the European Cup, and Celtic are famous first-timers. There were all sorts of reasons why Celtic were bound to win, if only fairy tales came true. are recognized in the crowd. It seemed as though every family had a representative there for this great occasion in the folk history of Glasgow. All the planning, training, coaching, hoping was over. 90 minutes of football, 
one mistake on one side or another could decide it all. Some of the Celtic players were singing as they came on the field. The homegrown side from the east end of Glasgow against the costliest team in Europe. Celtic competing for the first time versus Inter Milan, who had already won the trophy twice. Celtic lined up without McBride, Inter without Spires. <laughs> 